I'm Katie Neal and welcome to Boringwood Physio. It's really nice of you all to join us today. I know some of you have joined us on Zoom, some of you are checking in through Facebook Live and many of you will be watching this again once it's uploaded. So today's session is uh, the third in the series of our running series. We've already done um, some sessions for those of you who's had your marathons postponed and for new runners, we focused on some stretching and why that's important, foam rolling. And today's topic is a huge one. It's about strengthening and running. Now, there is a lot of evidence to say that strength and conditioning in terms of injury prevention really makes a difference. And Gemma and I together will be talking through some of those reasons. Gemma's session is going to go into a lot of the reasons why specifically for running and how you get those benefits. And I, as a physio, am going to really focus on a key muscle group, the hip abductors, which are here, and why that's important, and do a little practical teach that you can get your mats if you want to join in, a little practical teach about exercises and activations. So why are we doing this? I'm a physio with over 18 years of experience. I'm a Pilates teacher. I also have a run clinic. Um, Gemma and I are part of the Physio Academy group. And through this group, we quite a few run clinics. There's one in Harley Street, there's one in Hemel and further out of London and the home counties as well. And the purpose of this is to help you stay fit and well. We're passionate about injury prevention. So getting those runners who don't have any injuries coming in, having a little look at their technique, some essential markers and maybe giving you a program and working with you to improve your performance and reduce the risks of injury, as well as working with runners who are injured. It's really important for today's session that the first half really helps you understand what is going to be happening or why you should strengthen, and then you stay for the little teach at the end. If any of you have injuries at this time or you have pre-existing injuries, um, definitely listen to the strength and conditioning, have a watch about the strength session, but it may be more appropriate for you to have a session with a physio or another health professional to really build up a specific recovery program for yourself. So I'm gonna hand over to Gemma, who's gonna take over from here. Thanks, Katie. Um, I know some of you know me, but for those who don't, uh, I am a qualified England athletics coach. Uh, I've been qualified for a number of years now. I'm one of the coaches at our local running club, Gade Valley Harriers. I work with both individuals and groups of runners, anywhere from beginners to, to competitive runners, probably for over 10 years now. Uh, my favorite thing is to work with runners to help them understand their training, how they can influence what they do, and whether that's performance or health related. Um, I really enjoy working with Katie and some of the other professionals as well to give runners kind of an all-round experience to help them throughout their training journey. Um, we do come across injured runners probably more often than we would like. So uh, part of today is to talk about why you should, should strengthen and, and how it can help prevent injury. Uh, I'm gonna split it into two parts slightly. Um, the first part, I apologize in advance, there is a lot of information to go through. I'm, I'm really going to try and make it relevant for you, um, but there's, there's so many things and they are all important. And then I'm going to come on how to how you can sort of practically put that into your running program. So let's make a start. Um, just have a think, as a runner, I can almost bet on the fact that at some point, unfortunately, you have been injured. There are lots of reasons for that, which I'll come on to, but just keep this at the front of your mind for the moment. Um, how many times have you been injured in the last, say, six months or a year? Did it stop you running completely? And if so, how long was that for? Did it affect your performance? So it may not have directly affected it, but did you have to adjust your distance or your pace? And how much money did you spend potentially visiting um, professionals who may or may not have helped? And really importantly, how did it make you feel? I know when we're injured, it, it really doesn't feel great at all. It's frustrating. Um, it, it is really, really difficult. So to just bear this in mind as we talk through today. So why do we get injured as runners? Um, 
You may be interested and possibly quite shocked to know that actually as a runner, there is a 70 to 80% chance you will be injured within just one year. There's actually been no decrease in that injury rate since the 1980s, despite we've got lots of information available and things like I'm going to call them fancy running trainers, that 70 to 80% has not decreased. The reason we get injured mainly is we're putting a lot of overload and stress on our body. If you think um, when you take a 45 minute run, you're taking just over 8,000 foot strikes in that 45 minute run. Within those foot strikes, your ground force reactions, the amount of force you are putting through the ground is two and a half to three times your body weight. As I'm talking, have a think about how much you weigh, times it by three, that is going through each of your foot strikes when you put it down. During speed work, if any of you uh, do any speed work or run quickly, your Achilles is taking up to 12 times compressive body weight. And during hill work, whether that's up or downhill, your knees are taking anything from five to 11 times your body weight. This is just the start. You can see now building a picture of why, why possibly we start to get injured as runners. Most injuries are multifactorial, which means they involve lots of joints and muscles, which means they're also very difficult to recognize often before it's too late you know an injury um, just crops up and all of a sudden you, you're, you're stopped in your tracks you can't run and they can be quite complex and timely to treat so if at all possible we want to try and avoid being injured two of the main reasons we get injured is too much load on our body so too much uh, frequency intensity time or type of running and it boils down to our body's capacity to cope with that lots of factors again age previous injury your strength and mobility and your recovery and lifestyle so things like sleep and nutrition the one point for you to remember is it always comes down to too much too soon too fast now you're most at risk of being injured if you're a beginner so under one year experience in running, you have a previous injury. So the first three months after you've been injured, you're also high risk. You run more than 40 miles or three times a week. You've had a change in your training. So that could be volume, speed, your shoes, the environment or the technique you use. And actually women with a low BMI or reduced density are also in that high risk category as well. So how can strength training help us to prevent these injuries and most importantly, keep you running, not just prevent injuries, keep you running. You're a runner. That's what you want to do. So there are some ways you can reduce your training load when you're injured. And we, we can talk about that. I think we have a webinar coming up later in the series, actually. But what we want to do is prevent you from being injured in the first place. Now, just a side note. Um, changing your running style or your gait may help to reduce this load on your body, but it's actually more likely just to be modifying it, which could lead to different types of injuries unless this is managed correctly. So something like Katie talked about earlier, um, visiting a run clinic before you start to change your style or your gait. Now, what does strength training actually do? What, you know, what does it do to our bodies? How does it help us? Um, what it does is it improves our body's ability, so specifically the tissue capacity, to handle this load we're putting in and the forces we're putting through it. You can't do this through running alone. Running more will not help your body uh, handle these forces. It, it will do some other things. It will have training benefits, but it will not help you uh, manage this load. It needs to be done through either strength training, cross training or uh, your other lifestyle factors so nutrition hydration and sleep today we are just focusing on strength training so what does strength training do it toughens our tendons our ligaments and our muscles it stabilizes the joints so it coordinates all of our muscles firing and it improves this tolerance our tolerance to the change in load speed distance and endurance 
Now, why should you implement it into your running program? If you think back to my original questions, how many times you've been injured and it may have had a negative impact or a consequence of your running, you probably need to start thinking about changing your mindset. So rather than thinking about strength training as an aside or an addition to your running program, it needs to be seen as part of it. So really simple, if I was to say to you that running um, a certain distance or a certain session, a rep session, would reduce your injury rate by 50%, there's no question, you, you would do it. You would absolutely include it in your program. But I'm telling you that adding strength training into your program, you can see a reduction of overuse injuries by 50%. And yet, myself included, we, do, we don't do it. We still neglect to do it. One of the reasons might be um, people say, well, won't I get injured when I'm strength training? Possibly. That, that is a factor if you don't carry it out appropriately. But actually, you're 50 times more likely to get injured running than you are strength training in the gym. So not just injury related, but how can strength training improve our performance? Now, we don't just go to the gym, uh, do a bit of strength work, and the next day we run our, P, our, our PB at Park Run. One of the main reasons we probably don't implement this strength training is that we don't, you don't get that instant buzz or recognition from it. You go to the gym, you might lift some weights, we'll come on to how you can do this later. But, but nothing really happens straight away. It does take time. So things to think about, you know, in this, this time-based training is it does reduce your injury risk. I know I keep talking about it, but not only that, it means you can train more consistently and therefore your performance will improve. It improves your running economy. Strength training improves your running economy, which means your muscles get better at absor absorbing the oxygen that, that you're taking in. And therefore, it leads to uh, an improvement in performance. A very uh, stat again, uh, this performance improvement can be anything from 8 to 15%. So if you run a 25-minute 5K, if you implement some strength training into your program, it could drop down to 21K. I can't think of a lot of run training that does or has that same effect. It's a, a, a big, big improvement there. So I keep talking about it, but what do we actually mean by strength training? Now, there's lots of different types of training that's not running, which can be included in your program. And they can also reduce your injury risk. So things like mobility work. Uh, we talk about Pilates. We talk about yoga. These are brilliant cross training, anything other than running. So you may go and do some circuit work, go on your bike, do some walking. But for today, we are just talking about strength training. Strength training is specifically an exercise or exercises that causes your muscles to work or hold against an applied force or weight. This force can be applied in lots of ways. It doesn't mean going straight to the gym. It may start off that it's body weight. Uh, you may have some dumbbells, med balls, kettlebells, etc. We'll, we'll come on to how we can use those. There's four areas that we look at within strength training for runners. Now, the first one is really important, single leg loading. When we run, uh, we have all of our body weight on one single leg at a time. So doing things like squats, help, absolutely helpful, and there is a place for them but your strength training needs to be single leg loading. We look at our core strength. We look at our hip stabilization, which uh, Katie's gonna come on to later. And we look at strengthening our posterior chain. You may he hear that sort of banded around, but that is our back, our glutes and our hamstrings. A note on this, that symmetry, so having both sides of our body or both legs is always more important than overall strength. There is no point in building a, a, a great uh, ability for strength if you are not the same on each side. So how does it happen? How does this strength training help? Basically, we're looking to overload our bodies. So as we carry out the strength training, our bodies adapt to it. But in order for this to happen, we have to reach a certain capacity and actually continue to increase that. 
So you can't keep doing the same thing in the same way with the same weight and expect your body to improve. We actually have to look to progressively overload. Then we start to introduce some specific exercises. And then the next level on is to start adding in some periodization, which I'll come on to. Um, so that it does always remain challenging and effective. Now the bit probably you all want to hear about is how can you actually practically put this strength training into your program? A note to say, and Katie mentioned it earlier, if you are injured or you've got a, a history of an injury, then it's really advisable to consult with a physio or another professional so they can guide your strength program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, because these injuries are multifactorial, it may be the strength training that you're doing or what you think you're doing is, is fixing the problem, but it's not. It may be not the problem in the first place, and actually it may not be fixing it at all. But assuming you're not injured or you've had some advice or um, you haven't got a specific injury at the moment, then we can start to build on how we might implement this into our programme. So research again shows that strength training twice a week has shown to be adequate. Uh, there may be times when we increase this if there's a period of your training when you're out of, out of what we would call competitive season, you're not training for a specific event, we may increase our strength training uh, and other times where we may decrease it or we may level off. But it must be balanced with your running so that you avoid overtraining. Uh, we have a rule at Physio Academy actually that the, the best chance, the biggest chance of reducing your injury, um, remember this will link to your performance long term, is running three times a week, doing your strength work twice a week and having two rest days. Remember those rest days, you don't do your strength work on your rest days, they are completely separate. So I'm going to talk through how we can implement this as a beginner, uh, an intermediate and an advanced. Now those categories I just said are not related to your running experience, they are your experience in strength training. So it may be, and this is actually quite often the case, you are quite advanced as a runner, you've been running a long time, not related to your speed, but you actually haven't done any strength work before and therefore we would class you as a beginner. Now. During lockdown, I would say that we're almost all classed as beginners because we have no access to gyms, one-to-one um, -one professionals, etc. So this might actually be relevant for everybody to start with at the moment. But as we progress and hopefully come out of lockdown, we, we can move on. So as a beginner, usually body weight is actually enough to, to get this overload that I talked about. I'm not going to go into specifics because there are so many resources online. Um, but if you're using body weight only, it's very unlikely that you're going to sustain an injury or, or go along uh, sort of quite wrong with doing these exercises. But if you have got some equipment, the things that you would use as a beginner would be something like a resistance band, maybe a Swiss ball or a stability board. So that really starts to challenge you when you're doing these exercises. There's some really good online resources. Uh, one of them you may have heard of is James Dunn, Kinetic Revolution. You can't go wrong with James. Um, he has an excellent YouTube channel. Um, he, he does some great exercises on there. The Running Channel and possibly Runner's World, they've all got a variety of, of things that you can look at and get some ideas of how to start doing this strength training. Now do remember, as a beginner, anything is better than nothing. So focus on what's going to work for you. Pick um, a variety of exercises that you can do with correct technique in some of the areas I talked about earlier. So single leg, core, hip stabilization, and that posterior chain, so back, glutes, hamstrings. Start off really small, make it achievable. You might say, I'm just going to spend half an hour twice a week concentrating on two of those areas or it might be 10 minutes three times a week uh, just concentrating on one area but do remember anything you do is better than nothing so it's better to make a start just because you see someone doing an hour every single day uh, and, and you think oh i just can't do that i'm, I'm not going to do anything try and do something just put aside 10 minutes 
I know that you all make great plans for your running and you know when you're going to run, how far, where, start planning in your strength work and when you're going to do that. And that will help you really focus on it and try and tick that off your list. As we move on, uh, you may be an intermediate in your strength training. So once you've got this routine in place, and you can achieve the exercises with really good form, we can start thinking about some more equipment to maintain that overload I talked about. So examples for this would be dumbbells, kettlebells, med balls. The exercises that you're doing may still be similar to the ones you did as a beginner with body weight, but now we're including sort of a greater form of resistance. And remember, you don't necessarily have to put in more time here. It's actually slightly different to running. We don't have to run, <laughs> sometimes we have to run further. But with strength training, we don't necessarily have to keep increasing the time, but we do have to keep increasing the overload. So uh, your body has to learn how to adapt to that. Now, the gold standard of strength training advance really is the gym. I know we can't visit it at the moment, but, um, as runners, we're not the biggest fans of going to the gym. It's inside, there's lots of people there. It's, you feel like you haven't got space, but it really is the best place uh, for the, the experts there who know what they're doing. And there's equipment there that can only be found in the gym. So if you are joining a gym, just remember that most of the classes, so hip classes, circuits, Pilates, CrossFit, well, brilliant they are part of can be part of your run training program but they are not strength training it's, it's very unlikely they may have some elements within them but they're not specifically targeting strength you will need to dedicate some time outside of those classes for strength work now there's lots of personal trainers at the gym they use them they're really helpful and knowledgeable if you explain to them you're a runner and some of the areas that you might want to focus on, they can help you. They can show you some exercises, show you how to correctly use the equipment. You can go off for a period of time. It might be four to six weeks and you can start implementing that. So, so do use them. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a one-to-one -one PT all of the time. So when you're doing the strength training, how can you tell if it's working? You know, as I said, um, you don't get the instant recognition really. So how can you tell when it's working and how can you tell when to back off when you're doing too much? Three simple rules. If you have soreness after your strength training that remains for 24 hours or more, you need to regress. Whatever you were doing before, you need to take a step back. If you have soreness after training, but it resolves within 24 hours, you can carry on, keep the same same program and the same level of resistance or weight and if you have no soreness after your training that's when you need to step it up to the next level you need to add in more overload more resistance more weight uh, runners always ask me how long should I wait after my strength training or before before I run kind of thing so ideally we'd want to do our strength training on a separate day as I mentioned before, this is not your rest day, it is your strength training day. But if it's absolutely necessary to have both your strength and your running in the same day, we would advise a six hour spacing between the two. And it's always preferable to do your strength training first because this is where your technique is really important and needs greater attention. So as a summary, just a reminder, go right back to the beginning, think about the times you have been injured and how it made you feel. And remember that you need to kind of switch your mindset a bit to see that strength training is actually part of your running program. It's not detracting from it. It should always be progressive. You have to keep on top of this to achieve that overload. But it doesn't mean there can't be a period of maintenance when, you, when you're during your competitive season or your marathon training. But once you're out of that, you will need to overload again. If you decide to implement this, I'm strongly advising that you do, um, into your program, make it achievable for you. As I said, maybe you see people doing this lots of times a week. You feel that you, you, you can't do that or you can't keep up, but, but don't let that be an excuse. 
do what you can do and make start small and you can easily increase it if you need to. Um, if you're a runner, it's quite easy to kind of live in the moment. If you're running really well, you always think, well, I don't, I don't need to do this now. I don't need to strength training. I'm running a PB. But you need to think long term because as soon as you do get injured, you can't run potentially you can't run at all and that performance is going to drop right off with strength training you won't get that instant recognition but what you may notice is over a number of months your injury rate has decreased or maybe you've not been injured at all and it meant that you could just be more consistent with your running and therefore your improvement um, your performance could improve and lastly um, I always say this running is really important to me so therefore I'm going to try and do whatever I can when I'm willing to do whatever I can to keep running for not just today or weeks but months and years to come so I know it's difficult and we've covered lots of things today but really try and think about how important running is to you and when you're injured you can't run so what can you do to change that and it's not more running it's putting some strength work into your program um i hope that was helpful i know it was very very wordy today <laughs> um lots of information there but there'll be lots of time for some q a at the end and if you've got some specifics about or specific questions about how you can implement this um, into your training then we can talk about that then I hopefully just covered everything as a whole I think Katie looks like she's ready to uh, to do her, her demo and some live stuff I know I'm going to grab my mat and, and watch as well so I'll hand over to you Katie and I'll catch up with everyone else at the end for a Q&A thanks Katie oh thank you so much Gemma um, and thank you guys for staying with us and it's it's such a big topic strengthening and I know as a physio it can be really intimidating for lots of my clients. The typical conversation that I have when um, a client, a patient comes in, um, and this is not for the run clinic but this is with an injury and they are runners and you track back, there is a percentage that doesn't fit this but I would say the majority of people I go well tell me it tell me about your run history and they're, they're like really passionate and really keen and they tell me how many times a week that they're running and then I go well, well are you doing anything else and if I'm lucky they may be using a foam roller possibly stretching and we talked about why that's important last week and when I asked about strengthening it is the one area that the majority of runners that come in when they're injured, so that may tell you something, maybe the, the people who are strengthening are not coming in, um, of, are kind of lacking in their program. And there are lots of muscle groups that we focus on and we screen in the run clinic, but there's a lot of evidence talking about our hip abductor muscles um, and why that is important. So what's going to happen today we're going to go into the next part of our session on strength training and you're going to have to bear with me because we're going to do a little bit of things on the mat and we're going to do a little bit of things in standing and it's just me here and just one camera um, and I've got a couple of tripods so I'm going to hopefully move things around so that you can see. So we're going to start off with where our hip abductors are and uh, i'm going to do this in line and i'm going to pop up into standing and this is a great thing for you to do to be aware of where they are because there's no point doing a strengthening when we hear all these words and you read lots of these um blogs and they're amazing resources as Gemma said online but you're just not sure what muscle they're talking about so one of the easiest ways to find our hip abductors so that's a b d abductors is in side line so if I'm lying on my side and I kind of pop my hand onto this top part. So if you run your hand down the side, you'll kind of feel this little bony bit here. And when you feel that little bony bit, if you just allow your hand to just go backwards a little bit, that next bit of muscle that you feel, that is your hip abductor. We're not talking about the top of our hip. We're not talking about the front of the hip. We're not talking about kind of that bigger bottom muscle at the back. 
And so if I come up into standing, and you're just going to see a little bit of a changeover from the camera. So I want you just to think as we're doing this, if you've ever done exercises about hip, for your hip conductors before. So let's clip that in. Okay, so hopefully you can see me again. So in standing, if we're talking about our hip abductors, so this is the side, I'm sorry if the lights aren't that great with kind of a few of the light bulbs have just blown. Um, so here is me feeling the hip bones at the side. And if I just allow my hands just to kind of just go backwards a little bit, this bit here is my hip abductor. The posterior chain, these are back muscles, our glute muscles, our hamstring, kind of coming down into the calf a bit. This is called, if we're going to get technical, this is called kind of our posterior lateral sling or a lateral sling a little bit. Um, and for those who do Pilates or yoga, you know, will be, or my fascial stuff, will kind of be aware of that concept. So what is the role of these muscles? It's really, really important that we focus on the function of our pelvis when we run. So as we run, there is a point where we are on one leg. And we're aware of that, sounds really obvious. But the mechanics of our body, which means how our body moves and lands during that phase, has been shown to put people more or less at risk of injury. I am just focusing on one point. There are lots of other factors. And also please be aware that there are there is a percentage of the population who you would look at and the mechanics may be like, oh, that doesn't look like, that doesn't look great. The research would say that these people are going to have injuries and they're fine. So they, we're talking about the generalization, like everything in research is not an exact, complete exact science. So the generalization is that we need to have good stability around our pelvis to help reduce the risk of injuries. And you can have injuries to your hip, to your knee, commonly the ITB, which is this kind of runner's knee that you've heard of, which is this ITB band down the side. Weak hip abductors can also be associated with some ankle injuries because of how we land. What is the role of the hip abductors? I'm just going to change this a little bit more so that you can see my full leg. You may lose my head as I do this, but we'll go with that. So yeah, you can see my leg a little bit more and my head is still there. So we all have different shapes, okay? So this is the first thing to say. We all have different shapes. We, some people are more knock kneed some people are more bow-legged, some people kind of have like this wider hip to pelvis ratio. And what's important is that if I stand on one leg, do I have an ability to maintain a relatively kind of straight line between my hip, my knee and my ankle? Or when I go on one leg, does my knee really twist in? I sometimes call it this corkscrew effect. Sometimes you call it knee adduction. So that's a scientific way of saying that our knee goes in. And if we're running and we land on one leg and our knee kind of corkscrews or dips in, that's going to be one of those risk factors to increase knee pain, hip pain, and maybe kind of ankle pain. If our hip abductor muscle is weak, that is one of the key muscles that can influence, and research has shown, can influence people's risk for injuries, or people who are injured when they then test this muscle, they then find that it's weak. Two ways that we can notice that is if I get someone to stand on one leg, and we've screened that their mechanics look relatively neutral, which means in line, and we get them to stand on one leg, and as soon as they do that, their knee twists or moves in, we would do further tests to see if their hip abductor is weak. The other thing that you can sometimes see is it looks fine from here, but people kind of collapse on the side. So just imagine you're running, and then every time you land, there's just the tiniest side bend to one side, side bend to one side, side bend to one side. Or in reverse, you land and your knee goes in, and your knee goes in, and your knee goes in. Even if it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven percent, the more you're running, the more that's having an effect. And that's what we talk about, like a repetitive overstrain injury, because something small can build up and can cause a problem. 
So the hip abductors really help to keep the pelvis stable under load. So if I'm standing on one leg, my hip abductor helps keep my pelvis stable and prevent some of that kind of dropping down and dropping in. We look at lots of different exercises that we do. So we've got squats, we've got lunges, we've got single leg work, which is really important. But as a physio, specifically also dealing with people who are injured or who are looking to do prevention, sometimes we do these amazing functional exercises and they're brilliant and we should all have them in our programs. But the muscle that we're trying to fire is just a little bit lazy. And so what happens when I've seen as a physio is the body takes a path of least resistance. So if someone always has a weakness kind of through this posterior chain, through their hip adductors, and they're doing loads of kind of standing, squatting, knee bending exercises because they're thinking it's going firing, quite often, even despite your best intentions, the brain is kind of not maximizing the efficiency of that muscle. It's, it's kind of cheating. How much when we have to do a task do we all look for like an easier way to do it? Well, the brain and the body is exactly the same. So if this is a little bit weaker and harder to activate, maybe it's going to use our quads more. Maybe it's going to use our hip abductors and lots of different patterns. So this exercise that we're going to go through is one of those beginner exercises that we do to really isolate the muscle and really help with function. Now I have taught this probably thousands of times before and I know kind of some really quick tips to try and get this muscle firing, but that's through my experience. So I'm gonna go and share these with you. So if you're joining in, grab yourself a mat, grab yourself um, your pillows, and we're gonna go through this side lying hip abductor strengthening exercise. So camera change again. So unclipping, get yourself lying on your side, making sure that you're gonna feel nice and comfortable. Okay, back we go onto the mat. So, inside line, there's lots of research that shows that this is a really great way to activate the muscle. There are lots of different varieties for sideline exercises, and a lot of people have heard of the clam. Um, I don't necessarily favour that as my hip abduction exercise. I'm going to show you the one that, that I do, and also research says works really well. If you have an injury, if you have problems activating this, if this is something that you're struggling with at home, stop, please go and see a healthcare professional, come and see a physio, and they will work with you specifically. So, I'm going to lie on my side, and I see people propping themselves up like this. What happens when we do that is, can you, if you look at my waist, can you see how it's kind of squished a little bit? That's not going to help me in many ways. It's going to make this muscle, which is called our QL, our quadratus lumborum, start to get a little bit too active. So always make sure that your head is nice and comfortable. If you're used to doing Pilates, you may lie like this and you'll see me doing this. The other thing is, if you're lying on your side and your core strength isn't that great, then you may be wobbling everywhere. So kind of give yourself as much support as possible. From here, when we lie, we want to imagine that we've got like a little gap between our waist and the mat. And what that means is we're not collapsing through our waist again. So we're setting ourselves up for this good position. The basic level of this exercise is legs together. I call this spidey hands. So again, the core is another area to work on for running strength. We're not focusing on that today. Um, but if you feel that you can't stay on your side comfortably, don't use your whole hand and push down. Can you see how much tension it generates in your neck? So in my Pilates classes, I talk about spidey hands. So little little hand like this, just pop it on the mat, and that stops you generating too much force. I'm making sure I'm in line. It seems very simple, but a lot of people lie like this on the mat, or lie like this on the mat. So try and get yourself straight, get someone at home. If you don't have anyone with home at home with you at the moment, just do a Zoom call. Get someone to have a look at you on Zoom and see what happens. And so I look, I look down and just about see my toes. From here, what we're focusing on is getting an activation through that hip abductor. 
Now there are three things that you're going to feel potentially. The one that we want to feel is an activation in this muscle. Now, if you're strong, you're probably able to do 20 to even 30 repeats before this muscle kicks in. If you're weak, it could kick in after five or six. What we don't want to feel is the rest of our leg taking over. So if you're doing this exercise and you're feeling it anywhere else in the leg, in your knee, your calf, your foot, your toe, your back, your waist, your body is not activating this muscle correctly. And a lot of times what I see is people trying their best to do an exercise, but they're not activating it. So you can take this idea for any training that you do. If you think you're training your quads and you're not feeling it, then you need to get it checked. If you think you're training your glutes and you're not feeling it and you're feeling it in your back, you need to get it checked. Your exercise should be strengthening the target area. So from here, Again, I have enough strength to hold like this, just so that you can see, but remember that you can be here. I'm gonna keep that space in the waist, and I'm gonna lift my leg up to the side and down. It does not have to go all the way up into a split. If you are a ballet dancer, if you are hypermobile, if you have more flexibility in the hip, it can go up high, but the average person going a little bit above hip height is absolutely fine. So this is the basic level, up and down. Now, what are the things that you can do to try and make it more effective? We all have slightly different shapes in our body, and that can mean we need to adjust our technique to activate the muscle. So if you're starting off, if you're joining in and you're doing a few hip abduction exercises, and you're not getting activation, and you're like, I can feel it in my leg, I want you to try these techniques. Try them in an order, make sure you're not fatiguing and getting sore. The first thing that you can do is actually tip forwards. Now that doesn't mean twisting, it means using your hand, doing a little tip forwards, and mechanically what it does is it kind of turns this part of our bottom slightly up to the ceiling, which can allow it to activate. So first tip, slight tip forwards, up and down. Second tip is we can play with our, how straight or relaxed our leg is. Some of you need to think about really lengthening that leg away from the hip and then lifting up and down. You can maybe even pop your hand if you've got enough stability over that area. You may not feel it tighten, but you may feel it relax. So really lengthening away from the hip. Imagining you're lengthening. Some of you will try that and you'll be like, oh, hold on, my knee feels a bit sore. So it's the reverse. You're feeling it around the knee. Just soften the knee ever so slightly. So that's a third different tip, softening the knee ever so slightly. So we've got three so far, we've got slight tip forwards, we've got lengthening away, we've got slightly softening the knee. You could also be trying a combination of those, that's absolutely fine. Then there are another couple of things. The first is thinking about slightly, watch my foot, slightly turning my foot up to the ceiling as I lift. Not everyone finds this one helpful. The first three tend to be the more popular tips, but occasionally thinking about twisting the foot out can help. The other one that does help quite a lot is imagining, you can see these covers behind. I'm gonna imagine that my heel is staying in line with the covers. That doesn't mean I'm kicking the covers. I'm not going all the way back, that's a different exercise but I can just imagine that it's sliding up and down. And this actually allows my leg to stay kind of in line with my body. So that's a really nice tip as well. You can do this lying on the floor, just with a wall behind you, and just imagining that leg is going up and down. So to go through again, tipping forwards, or lengthening the knee, slightly softening the knee, turning the foot out, 
or visualizing that it's going up and down. Have a play with that, see what's happening. The final tip that you can do for this exercise is, mostly I've got a pillow here, is sometimes actually, because the muscle's so weak, you need to have, start off with something between your legs. Um, and actually popping it there means the muscle finds it easier to activate. That's the simplest way of understanding it without going into physiology. So you could start with something like a little cushion or something between the knees and then do exactly the same tips as before. Exactly the same tips as before. So that's the first thing, learning how to activate the muscle. And then what you can do from that position is go, well, how many can I do on my right side? How many can I do on my left side? And compare, and Gemma talked about symmetry, it's really important. And if you notice one side is weaker than the other, when you do your strength training, your left side can do 20, but your right side could do 40, you stick to the left side, so you're building up that difference. And in any other strengthening that you're doing, really comparing the ability of each side is important. Because if you're squatting, and your left side is weaker than your right, actually your right side's gonna be doing a lot more of the work, potentially, so it's really good to try and find this out. If you're finding, okay, I can do quite a few sets of those and we'll talk about how many once I'm back up and standing, then you can make it harder. Simple ways to make it harder, you can bend your knee. You can watch me again, if I bend my knee, it drops down, starts from a lower position, and I go up and down. That's a very simple way to just take this exercise. As I said, there are hundreds of exercises like this that we're focusing on hip abduction and side lie. The next thing you can do, and I have to look where I put them, is you can get these resistance bands. So these resistance bands, you can get in lots of different colors. You can pop them around your ankles. And again, just think about up and down, against resistance. And you could progress that with different loading. So I'm just gonna stop for now, coming back up into sitting, maybe I'll stay in sitting for this little part. So when we go into those exercises, how many should we do? As Gemma said, we're looking as part of a run program, which is not the same as post injury. We're looking at doing this exercise a couple of times a week. When we're strengthening in the first couple of weeks of strengthening, what we're doing is we're waking up the ability of the muscle to fire. It's called the neural program. It takes six to eight weeks to truly build strength in a muscle. And one of the reasons injuries happen when we run is because our cardiovascular, our ability to feel fit, improves quicker than our ability to strengthen. So injuries happen because people are doing couch to 5K, people are suddenly going from 5 to 10K, and their fitness is improving. But that little 1%, 10% weakness I talked about at the start hasn't been addressed. So you get this massive imbalance, and I think about it like a triangle, and then kind of you get this slight like crash and burn. So right now, where a lot of people are in lockdown, I'm not saying that means that you have, some people are just as busy, but your schedule is different. The reason we're doing these sessions is because I was like, I know people's marathons are postponed, but what would happen if they actually did strength and conditioning now? Or the people who are doing couch to 5K actually did strength and conditioning plus some of the other stuff we're talking about. How much better would their season be? How much better would their running be? So going back to reps, because I know I sidetracked there, you're trying to repeat till fatigue. What does fatigue mean? Fatigue is the effort in a muscle, just very simply. I love zero to 10 scores. Zero is no effort, you can keep going forever. 10 out of 10 is you, you basically hurt yourself and it feels really sore. We're wanting to go to six to eight out of 10 in terms of effort. And you're gonna start off with just kind of activation reps or endurance reps, which means three sets to four sets, looking at 15 to 20 times. Now, if you are weak, if you are weak and you do this and you're like, I did not realize I listened to Katie and Gemma's thing. I'm like, I can't believe how weak my abductors are. Then you will never get to kind of 45, 50 reps to start off with. Your first goal may be just building up your reps to that endurance rep. 
So till you can do at least 45 of those, kind of three sets of 15, three sets of 20, you shouldn't be making it harder. When you can, you start to develop the muscle in different ways. You can put more resistance on, which challenges the muscle more. And as it gets harder in terms of the load you're putting on, the amount of reps that you do reduce. And there are lots of resources on the internet that talk about that further, but very simply, light load, lots of reps, heavier load, less reps, and we want to progress endurance to strength and then we talk about power and sometimes still we mix it up so even when we're working at a higher load heavier resistance every so often i'll take the load off and do a few endurance reps once the muscle is activated then we can come up and we can incorporate that into loads of other exercises we can do single leg stand we can do lateral steps which is kind of like the crab walk we can do lunges and that's probably going to be another program that we're going to do so I hope you found that really useful. I know you may need to watch that again a few times just to check. And if you're lying on your side and it's a bit tender, ladies more than men, really quick tip, get a little pad, pop it underneath your hip that you're lying on. So I'm just gonna hand over to Gemma to see if there's anything else that she wants to add. So over to you, Gemma. Hi okay, Katie, thank you. Um, no, nothing to add really, that's really helpful. It was just to say, if anyone was thinking, where do I start with my strength training? Then uh, it sounds simple, but just doing that one exercise twice a week would be your perfect start. That, that would be absolutely better than what you're doing now if what you're doing now is nothing at all. <laughs> that, that's where I would start. So that's helpful. And he went through it really, really clearly, Katie. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Gemma. And yeah, that's a really good point. There are lots of muscle groups. I picked that one because it's associated with lots of injuries. We've got ability to strengthen our glutes, our quads, our hamstrings, our calves. We've talked about flexibility in our upper body. So thank you so much for joining us. As always, if you have anything that you want to address, you can find um, our bios attached to the events. Um, all of these posts are going to be uploaded onto YouTube and to Facebook. I'm still taking virtual appointments at the moment. Gemma does take on personal clients that she works with. She likes to build a relationship with these clients. So it's really people who are interested in developing their running over a season. And she's absolutely amazing. And I've worked with her quite a lot and had clients who've worked with her. And it's a great relationship. So coming up for the running sessions, um, I'm going to be going through balance, I'm going to be going through some general, general stretches, we're going to be talking about nutrition and all these other factors that you may not have thought about, but right now is a great time to start improving your awareness of your health around running rather than just the running itself. So please look after yourself, stay safe, stay well. If you've got time to help someone out at this time, but you're looking after yourself as you do that, it's really nice to give back. So thank you very much and bye for now.